because I didn't get my way. They went ahead and did what they were going to do, and I had to fix it when it was done. I think a lot of us have been through that. But they were going to do it anyway. And so I figured out I'd better get on board or I'm going to get run over by the train of them. And so over time, I found that we actually could find a way forward to get both of those things done. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership with one of the contributors to my latest book, the best-selling CISO Compass Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, as well as other top CISOs and industry security leaders. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. I am your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Ross Leo, CISO at Invisalert Solutions Incorporated and former Chief Security Architect, Mission Control at Johnson Space Center, NASA. Sometimes the universe has a better idea of what you should be doing than you do. And with the universe being a little bit bigger than me, it seemed to choose computers and security um, as where I ought to be. I was... Just just to take about 30 seconds and tell you, I was actually on track to complete a master's in public health. The Navy and I back, and I'm reluctant to say just what century this was in, because it's that long ago. Um, we had made an agreement that I was going to do that and go back into the service as a commissioned officer in the public health service on duty with the Navy. And I had already started the master's program. And then when I moved to to Houston to complete my master's degree, I got a job as a NASA contractor with IBM because my scholarship and my GI Bill was not covering all of the expenses that living seems to require of us. And as soon as they found out that I had done access control, or the computer that ran the transcription pool at the Naval Hospital where I was stationed before, they said, ah, just what we're looking for. And I wasn't exactly sure what they meant by that, but it turned out that they needed somebody in information security. So I began, and this was 1980 or so, I began learning about what security was about through access control, which I find is a place where a lot of us began that and networks and so on, as I'm sure you're very much, you know, very much aware. But that was how it started. And even though I hadn't given up on the idea of completing my degree program that way, it appears that the universe had a different idea. So one thing led to another. And here we are in 2022, and I'm still doing the same thing. So, so at, at one point you were uh, with... Um with NASA, right, as the chief security architect? When when I started in 1980, it was because I needed, I needed to work, you know. And 22 years later, I was still there. And by that time, I had been there long enough and done enough things that I had been promoted to the role of chief security architect and program manager for information security, effectively the CISO for the space station and shuttle programs here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. So, yep, that's where I ended up. Wow, that's <clears throat> that, that's uh, quite quite a responsibility uh, to have that kind of a role. It was it was the most cool place in the world to work. It to be also the most frustrating, but it was um, it was definitely an awful lot of responsibility. But I had a great team to work with, and we managed to keep things pretty well well secure. Well, great. Um, so I, I'm excited about this topic today uh, that we're going to talk about. These, you know, striving that balance between uh, security and operations, mm-hmm. and um, 
you know, as a CISO, we we have many different challenges, different different areas, but this seems to be one that sometimes we come to loggerheads over. So help help paint us the the, the picture of you know why is this a, a a difficult area and what are some of those issues that we're facing? What I find is, as you just said, there are times when we get to loggerheads, and it's oftentimes with the business. Because we, as security professionals, always think of protecting things. And, well, to go back to my NASA days, one of the things that I learned very early, and it was somewhat of a painful lesson, anytime anybody was meeting about a new project or a new piece of software or something like that, security was told we were going to attend. And we did. Well, I soon learned that people thought that I and my colleagues worked in the department of no. Because almost everything they wanted to do, people told me this later, the security people tended to say, nope, you can't do that. It's not secure. But instead of offering solutions or alternatives, they just basically said, nope, you can't do that. Well, that's not an answer. We have to find a way forward. So I very quickly learned that I'd better change departments from the department of no to the department of how can we and start thinking in terms of making security fit the picture that's being painted for me rather than just laying down the law and saying, nope, this is the way it's got to be. It's got to be secure. And if you can't do it that way, then you can't do it, period. Well, that attitude would not have worked at NASA, which has a history of making things work no matter what it took. So what I learned from that was <clears throat> security needed to make a change, kind of, a, kind of an evolutionary change, I felt, not a revolutionary one. It had to find the way to assist business operations, whatever it might be, to find that way forward. But because we did have to do the security, a lot of it was in regulations, of course, we had to find the way forward to get the thing we wanted to get done accomplished. And maybe we had to do something a little different, but we had to get that done. We wanted to get it done securely, but we couldn't really compromise on a lot of things. Some things we had some room on, though. So it helped me develop this creative mindset which is to find the way forward by trying to meet those two often competing and even conflicting goals and still getting the job done. And over time, I learned that there's always a balance that has to be struck between the two. Business can't run off and do things that are, well, quite honestly, dangerous sometimes. But security can't get its way because that way nothing happens. So, It was through a period of experiences which in one way were negative because I didn't get my way. They went ahead and did what they were going to do, and I had to fix it when it was done. I think a lot of us have been through that. But they were going to do it anyway. And so I figured out I'd better get on board or I'm going to get run over by the train of them. And so over time, I found that we actually could find a way forward to get both of those things done. And the CISO, I find, is in the position where they have to set the tone and the direction for how security enables business rather than acts as an impediment. And it's still very much a work in progress. I think we're finding more and more that we can do it and do it well. But our mindset has to change, and so does the business mindset, if we're going to make that actually work. So it's been that kind of a process. What were some of those challenges that you were facing that that come to mind where you said uh, in your head, uh, oh, my God, we can't do this, but you had to find a a solution um, for that? Many times the technical teams that would bring us these kinds of things, and I say us because I was never a lone wolf. We had an excellent team to work with. We had to examine what they were going to do, of course. We had to look at what the thing was that they wanted to do. 
and how it was supposed to work. And what I found was a lot of my predecessors, as soon as they ran into a roadblock and said, hmm, there's a security question there. And they turned that into a no, that's a deal breaker, basically. What I found I had to do was say, all right, what are you trying to accomplish there? And they would tell me. And then I'd say, hmm, I'd have to go away and think about it for a while. But I would almost always come back and say, you know, there is a way. Oftentimes, what they wanted to do was take the most expedient route. And I can't say that I blame them because... The more time you spend trying to work around something than working through the problem and solving the actual problem than simply working around it, you find that all the time you've spent would have been better focused on how to improve the solution rather than trying to come up with what might be a much more complicated way around as an alternative. So what's one of those examples that comes to mind uh, that that, uh, sticks in your mind? We had we had some flight software, and I'm going to kind of pick a rather, well, a rather dramatic example, I suppose. We had some flight software, and the software was going to be on the ground, communicating with the vehicle, and we were going to have to find a way to help it sense where the vehicle was using uh, a NASA GPS predecessor, what we called Tedris. And we needed to have it transmit at a certain rate. They didn't want to transmit it at a particular rate that involved encrypting the signal because that was going to slow it down back back in those days. And I, you know, it is like the Stone Age, really. Back in those days, computers were slow enough and a lot weaker than they are today And encryption ate up an awful lot of computing cycles. And so signal delay, possible corruption of the signal was going to be a problem. And so they decided that they wanted to put in an integrity coding system and see if that worked. Well, it did kind of. But the problem that I pointed out to them was, if we do that... And if, let's say, a hostile party wanted to intercept a signal and change what the signal was saying, there's an awful lot of really bad things that could happen, you know, the absolute worst. And of course, this is not something that you want to imagine. But if, for example, it's trajectory data, they can make the thing run back into the Earth well ahead of schedule. They can make it run into something else that is on orbit. They can do a lot of things, this hostile party. Fortunately, we never had any of those that were able to do that, but that was the problem. And you have to maneuver around things when you're on orbit because there's an awful lot of stuff up there that you just basically have to go around. Orbital potholes, you could call them if you like, or obstructions. So what we had to do is we had to come up with a way of protecting the signal to keep those sorts of things from happening. And... We had to come up with a way of doing it that it could keep up with the rate of speed that it needed and yet still be protected. Well, nobody argued that the signal needed to have full integrity at all times, but it was a question of they didn't want to bother waiting to get the additional horsepower that would make this possible, to make it work the way it was supposed to. Well, that was really kind of the solution that we had to come up with, but it was a way of finding it out and having security work by augmenting what we had to make it work like it was supposed to, because to go ahead with it the way that they had intended was exactly what I would expect engineers to do. It's mm-hmm. the most expedient way. And of course, I think, I, I, I think I'm seeing, saying the obvious here. NASA certainly has a lot of stellar engineers. But they were trying to meet a deadline. So the solution, to put it, Uh, quickly. We found some additional hardware. We found some additional signal processors that ran very fast, much faster than the processors we were using. So we recoded it for a different platform, and we were able to solve it that way. But it was a solution that nobody, including me, had come up with. We had to talk about it a group and really resolve what the real problem was. Since we did, we had a solution and it worked. 
So it taught me that creativity can be one of our best aids as long as we're willing to do it. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers. We had a, a, another uh, one of our podcasts from CISO Stories uh, that uh, uh, Dan Lorman had 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 talked about putting Wi-Fi in the conference rooms that he was asked by the, the state of Michigan to put that in mm-hmm. there. And he yep. was told that he could not be the CISO if his answer was no. Uh, and he, because the response back was, well, there are other companies out there that we're putting Wi-Fi in conference rooms. And so why why aren't we able to do this? Even though he had done his research and found a whole stack of reasons why this was a bad idea back in mm-hmm. back in that time. And I think we, you know, we're always facing new technologies. You know, we're, you know, we're moving into a 5G world and we're, mm-hmm. you know, higher bandwidth and we have artificial intelligence and um, machine learning. And and so whatever the technology is we're always going to have this push pull between uh you know the engineers and and security so so what, what sort of things can we can we do to to make that relationship um you know be a good relationship and and, and satisfy both parties well i've i have gone back to a phrase that i once heard and i don't remember where i heard it but it basically is seek first to understand, then to be understood. And as trite as that may sound, sitting in many meetings over the course of time, I have found that security people tend to tend not to listen always to, and I and I'm not picking on anybody in particular. I'd pick on myself if I if I could. Initially, this was me. I would have to say that many times they're looking for ways to poke holes in what other people are doing. What's wrong with what you're doing is would be a fra- would be a statement that they would make. It's not secure is the way the statement ends. But by using seeking first to understand, I try very hard to listen very carefully and engage in that part of the conversation where for a time I'm in full receive mode to hear everything that they're telling me. And all I'm trying to do is understand first. Then what I try to do is repeat back to them. And again, this sounds old and trite. I try to repeat back to them what I understand they really want to do. And I might even say it a different way to try to see if I really do understand what they've told me. The people that are trying to do this technological thing that may have some fairly serious security implications. Once I know that I'm on the same page with them, we talk about the issues of the operation, where they see problems, and I share with them where I see problems. And what we do and what we end up doing is getting all of this cleared away so that we all have a clear understanding of what we're trying to accomplish, what we're really trying to do. For example, I might ask, what sort of things do you think people are going to to use your uh, Wi-Fi example? What sort of things do you think people are going to be saying or doing or transmitting that are going to go through those links that might provide a real risk that we have to take care of? And they would say, well, we don't really know. Okay, you have an unknown that you have to deal with. If that's the case, the usual way is to err on the side of caution. And if we do that, it's this and this and this and this. How do you think that will play with what you're thinking about doing? And they'll think about that for a while. And then they'll say, well, I don't know. I don't know that that's going to work. Okay, then we discuss that. So we go through this question and answer discussion, you know, basically open think tank kind of an operation until we can come to a complete understanding or as complete as we can of what is anticipated to go on. And then we work towards how we can bring the security technology in 
to deal with the things that are largely unknowns and still get everything done. Then once we've landed on a solution of some sort, maybe two or three possible options, we try them out until we see which one actually works. Now, I can go with a very high level, very strong security solution, but I always use this other phrase, always use security in a way that is commensurate with the value of what you're trying to protect, which means essentially don't go overboard. Do it. Do what is enough for what you think the risk is going to be for as long as you think the risk is going to persist, but don't overdo things. Because overdoing things is what leads to the complication, and that leads to the loggerheads you mentioned earlier a lot of times. So by doing that, we're able to experiment and come up with something. So instead of doing you know, high-level encryption at a very strong level, I back off of that a little. I back off of that somewhat, go to a lower level, but one that I believe is adequate for the risks I understand. And then we try it again. Then they you, try something. How do you how do you work with the with the board then in terms of so you made this decision and and you didn't put the you know the you know the full uh you know best 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 solution in place and then you get breached and then something happens and now management's mm -hmm. coming back to you and saying well why didn't you do this other thing what would your response be then well my response is one of the very first conversations I have with management and board, and I've done this several times, you know, with varying results, is to manage their expectations about just that sort of thing. There is no security program. Todd, you know this as well as, as anybody, too. There is no security program that is going to be perfect. Perfect is a machine or a system that doesn't do anything. And I try to get them to understand it, and I tell them why. And the basic rule is the, ba the bad guys can know everything about our system that we do. And then we explain that a bit. So I first try to manage their expectations about that. Then I tell them, and it doesn't matter how much money or staff you give me. We can only do what the technology is. We can only make it work as well as we can make it work, which is as well as anybody on the planet can make it work. But a hacker doesn't play by our rules. I make sure that the board and management understands that this is the world we're in when we're talking about these kinds of issues. Hackers are not kids in basements anymore. These are business people who have uh, state sponsors, endless money, and they also probably have a mandate that either you make this happen or it's not going to go well for you, which might mean prison or worse. Mm -hmm. So they have every incentive to try everything, which means they don't play by our rules. So these are the things that I first try to make sure that they understand. And I always make sure that I've got a strong business case for almost anything I'm going to take to them. And I'm going to talk about risk. And I'm going to tell them what the risk is to them as a board, to a company, or to them personally. As executives at this level, they may have some liability that they have to come to grips with. So I make sure we have all of those conversations at the outset. And then I make sure that they know that we are being transparent with you. We are telling you everything that is true, even if it's a truth that's unpleasant. Right. And then that, that allows you to then make the decisions with with the engineers. Well, right. I, R R Ross, this is, this has been great um, talking with you about this. I think this is uh, such a, a key topic uh, today because it, it helps you know determine how how effective we're going to be with our teams. It, mm -hmm. What final advice would you give uh, current CISOs, emerging CISOs, experienced CISOs? Uh, as they're working with their operational uh, departments uh, within the organization? I think that a CISO, given the level, has to come to grips with the fact that they're largely a business person with a security background, and they have to appreciate the concerns of the business people that 
they try very hard to be a peer with. You have to speak to them in their language because they're not going to learn your security speak. And you have to understand the issues that they face. And you have to grasp that they make compromises all the time in what they're doing to meet their various deadlines and goals. And you're not in, an, you're not in a different position, except in the way that you have to try to make sure that they can meet it without bad things interfering. You need to let them see you as an enabler and a team member and make it really seem that way by what you do every day. I saw something just yesterday that I think is a handy thing to close this out with. And it was, it's a little different the way I'm going to say it than what I saw. But it's integrity is not owned, it's rented. And the rent is due every day. And that was on one of the LinkedIn pages that I think you and I both subscribe to. And I don't know of anything that sums it better in those few words than that does. Because our job is about integrity. Can people believe us and do we portray things the right way? And by being a team member and working with them to achieve the balance and doing it honestly and transparently, I think that's probably the best way to be successful for the long term to help everybody succeed. And that's what I try to do every day. What a, what a great saying. I, I'm, I, I wrote that down. I, I, I think that's just a great thing to practice. Um, thanks a lot, Ross. Thanks for taking the time to share your, your wisdom with people. Today. It's been, it's been an honor and a pleasure to be here with you, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Visit more CISO Stories podcasts on securityweekly.com, where you will find an index to prior episodes. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com.